Hey guys, it's Olivia here from Olivia's Catastrophe and today I'm here to give you my newts wrap up which is also my August wrap up because I didn't read anything that was not for the newts. So last month I read 17 books and I'm here to tell you all about them and what I thought. We've got a huge range here from brilliant books to terrible books. To get an A in Ancient Runes, I read Five Feet Apart by Rachel Lippincott, and this book was actually surprisingly a good read for me. Five Feet Apart is about two teenagers who have CF, however the male love interest has uh, bacteria that could be very very dangerous for Stella who is our main character and it's kind of the typical YA cichlet, they kind of have a romance going on but they can't be together, they have to stay at least six feet apart from each other, yes six feet, not five feet away from each other because if she gets that bacteria she could die. So while I found this one a little bit predictable, things happened in the form and way that I expected things to happen, I did find it really interesting to learn more about CF because that is not something I've ever learned about before and I also found Stella to be such a lovely character she's just she's so strong and she's struggling with so much but she still manages to be so hopeful and uplifting and she's trying to do the most for the people that she loves and I really really valued that I feel like they tried to make the main character a really bad boy kind of thing but it didn't really come across as that and quickly that kind of is over overridden so it was a bit ridiculous that they tried to pass it off like that but overall I did really enjoy this one and it surprised me because I thought it was going to be very predictable and if you want to know my opinion I liked it more than The Fault in Our Stars. Then to get Ian Ancient Runes I read Under the Jaguar Sun by Italo Calvino. Italo Calvino is an Italian writer so this is translated literature and in this one you get three short stories which are all to do with different senses. One focuses on taste, I think one focuses on hearing, and there is a third sense included as well. Italo Calvino's writing is very abstract and to be honest it's so hard for me to say what I feel about this book just because it's almost impossible to pinpoint my feelings. When I read them I feel a bit flabbergasted, I'm so confused with what's going on, but at the same time if you think deeper, you can see what he's getting at and what he's trying to do, which makes perfect sense, but at the same time it makes no sense at all. So if you like weird abstract classics like Alice in Wonderland, you might enjoy these adult short stories. I feel like they're a good taste tester to get a bit more of his writing style, but overall I just cannot make up my mind about what I think about Italo Calvino's books. Then to get an E in Ancient Runes I read World After by Susan E. This was the second book in the trilogy of Angel Fall. I'll tell you what the first one is about. So the first one is about Penryn and her sister. She lives in this post-apocalyptic world where angels have come down for heaven and they're kind of wrecking the whole place and the planet and her younger sister who is in a wheelchair, Paige, gets kidnapped by these angels and as that is happening one angel gets severely injured and it is up to Penryn to partner up with this severely injured angel to go and find and save her sister. So this is the second one and after the events of the second book I was very curious to see where everything was going to go. They introduced some very weird, wacky but still intriguing monsters in the first book. However, I feel like in this book it just didn't angel enough for me. While there were angels, it's kind of these new monsters that have become a bit more of a focus and a bit more of the plot line. And there was one angel in particular I wanted more of and that was Raf. We kind of only get to see him in the last 20% and let's be honest, I'm more reading this series for the young adult teen angel romance and for Raf and Penryn's banter than for the post-apocalyptic storyline. This one focused more on the post-apocalyptic storyline, so if that's something that intrigues you, you're going to enjoy it a lot more than I did, but as that wasn't really my goal for being there, I just felt a bit frustrated that we won't get enough Raph and Penryn together. I will say that sometimes the plot seems a little convenient, especially things that have to do with the twins and the sword, but other than that, it's a pretty okay story. It was good enough for me to want to read the finale, especially with the scene where they left on because wow, but at the same time I was a little bit disappointed. Then we're moving on to Arithmacy for a book that ends on an even page number. I read The Colour of Shadows by Philida Shrimpton. Now The Colour of Shadows is not at all what I expected from when I started reading this book. It follows Saffron who goes into the attic and finds a secret that her father has been keeping from her for a very very long time and she chooses to run away from home because of this but all her friends fail her and she kind of is left on her own. So when I read this one I thought it was going to be a bit more like We Are Okay by Nina 
Le Coeur when it comes to terms of what the secret is. And while the secret is something quite similar to that secret, rather than the secret being the entire focus of this book, a lot of it is the focus of the fact that Saffron runs away from home and has nowhere to go. For a couple of days, she starts to live life as a homeless person and she really has her eyes opened to homeless lifestyle because she is rich and she is used to having everything that she wants and she doesn't really understand that homeless people are actually people she doesn't really understand any of their backstories and this whole journey is very very eye-opening for her when i read this one in the beginning i was quite annoyed with saffron as a main character she's spoilt she's rich she doesn't realize how much people love her and actually care about her yes maybe her dad did something that's absolutely terrible but but let me just leave it there and so in the beginning I was a bit frustrated but the more and more I read the more I saw the homelessness theme sneaking in and the more I could see Saffron changing and learning and I feel like sometimes it's good when you keep reading books where you don't like the character because the character is purposefully made for you to not like her because she's gonna go on a journey and she's gonna develop so in the end I did enjoy The Colour of Shadows and I feel like the homelessness theme was done very very well if you read the author's note you will see that she was part of a movement where she got to live life as a homeless person for a little bit to raise money for homeless people and she a lot of the scenes and situations in this book are based on true stories that's why I feel like I could buy this story so much I really believe the homelessness situation and that's because the author has done their research in it thorough detail then to get an E in Ancient Ruins I read The Little Princess by Frances Hodgson Burnett. I had to read this one for uni and it was actually a reread because when I started reading it I was like wow this seems familiar, wow I know what's gonna happen and then I realized I think I've read this before when I was younger. So the little princess follows Sarah, she's this young girl who has a father who she really loves. Her father goes off to make a fortune and then word comes back that he is dead and he has died without any fortune so actually Sarah is in a lot of debt, she's orphaned and so rather than the school that she's staying in taking care of her and treating her well they kind of make her into a slave girl kind of like the maid that already exists while I did not hate this book, I didn't particularly love it either. I think when I read it when I was younger, I'm going to say this, that I absolutely loved it because I wanted to be a princess when I was younger. Like that was my firm occupation in my head. So reading this book about what it means to be a princess must have just blown my mind and made me very, very happy. However, reading it as an adult, which I know is not the target audience, it made me see quite a few problems with this book. For starters, Sarah is too much of a perfect girl. She just seems perfect in each and every way and that is quite frustrating because nobody is perfect. She needed a lot more flaws. I feel like there's very clear distinction between black and white characters here. There's no in between and because of that it seems a bit stale and a bit forced. It doesn't seem very natural. And last but not least, Sarah's storyline, the way that she ends her story versus the way Betty ends her story is really interesting and I feel like although it isn't racist, the ending, it just makes you think about the difference of their happy endings when it comes to their skin colour and economical situation. It's really saying that one type of girl can have one thing but the other type of girl can only have this extent of that kind of ending. While I don't want to say that this book was racist because it was never explicitly so or felt so, sometimes the way they described black people or Indians in this book made me uncomfortable but it's not overtly racist. I don't know how to word it better than that, I apologise. But that's all I really have to say about that one. Then to read a book with a flower on the cover, which was for my E in Arithmacy, I read The Colour Purple by Alice Walker and my mind was blown. I rated this one five stars. So this is a novel told entirely in letters. This one follows most Lady Seely, who lives in the Deep South. She's been abused by her father. She's currently being abused by her husband and she's just trying to live her life, look after her children and get by with as little abuse as possible. Throughout this book other black female characters come into this one and I just want to say that this book just shocked me in each and every way. I knew it was about black women and their suffering and the struggles that they had to go through and while I like that this book is about racism, about um, domestic abuse, about rape, guys, triggers for all of those things, at the same time, I really like how it is 
female centric it's about black women struggles yes you see some black men in this book yes you see some black men's struggles in this book but you really primarily focus on the black woman as well as that i did not expect to have lgbt plus rep in this because it is a classic and i find black lgbt plus classics they're so hard to find if you've got some put put the comment down below because i need to read them but in this one you do get some ff romance vibes i think you've got a bisexual character i think you've got a lesbian character i say i think because it's never explicitly stated but that's what i'm just assuming from what i got in this book i just loved it at first it took me a while to get into the letter style the writing style is also a bit unique because it's written how um, Celie talks and as she's uneducated she writes in her own dialect with the way that she says things but man this one took me on a journey and there's so many deeper themes that you could go into but we don't have time in this wrap up so at some point I need to film a detailed review of this. Then for potions for A I read my friend's favourite book and that was Fendi from Caught Between the Pages. You should definitely check out her thoughts on Peter Pan on her channel because she gives a different opinion and I think it's important to hear that opinion too. However Peter Pan was my worst read this month and I really didn't like it. It's the story you all know about this young boy who lives in Netherland and he never grows up and Wendy gets taken there and everything. But when I read this book, okay, first of all, it's split into two parts, Peter and Kensington Gardens and then Peter and Wendy. Peter and Kensington Gardens was completely unnecessary and boring. Don't ever read it just because you don't really need to read it. Read Peter and Wendy if you want to read a Peter Pan story because that's much more interesting. However, Peter and Wendy is just racist. The way they talk about um, the natives on the island is just absolutely horrible and terrible and they even use the r word for describing them which is highly offensive and the fact that peter pan becomes a white savior character is just very problematic wendy and peter pan and the lost boys everything is very gendered wendy is a mother character she stays at home the boys go on the adventures she just stays back and looks after them and is entirely content doing so so it's very gendered it's very racist Part of the time, but I don't care, I didn't enjoy reading it. I found it to be a boring story as well, not really much happens, and when things happen, it's just kind of, and it's not interesting. The best character in this one is Hook. I feel like he has a very interesting contrast to Peter Pan, and he could be really intriguing. However, he's not actually in the book much. I know why that is, because I've been studying this book as well, but I'm gonna do a longer review where I share my thoughts on Peter Pan, because while I didn't like Peter Pan, J.M. Barry managed to do exactly what he wanted to do with this book. So you can't fault his author intentions because he achieved those, but for enjoyment reading, it just didn't make the cut for me. Then to get an E in potions, I read The Red Ribbon by Lucy Ablington. So this one is a Holocaust story and I don't know if I should put it as middle grade, I don't know if I should put it as young adult, maybe young young adult slash upper middle grade. It follows 14 year old Ella as she is put into Auschwitz and she um, becomes a dressmaker in one of the factories there and it talks about her friendship with her best friend Rose and just kind of their experiences there in the prison camp. In the beginning, I struggled a lot. I thought it was going to be upper young adult, so I didn't expect the young tone, which shocked me. But once I got used to it and realised that it was not the age audience I believed it was going to be, I enjoyed this one a lot more. I warmed up to it, and in the middle, it got so sad, and then it got very intense as well. Ella goes through a lot, Rose goes through a lot, and even though the author does a very good job of explicitly stating what happens, sometimes she doesn't as well, and the the readers just have to assume and I think that's really good for children who are reading this. I felt like in the beginning it was too happy for a World War II story. I felt like they were dodging around a lot of the very dark and grim realities but as the book goes on more and more of those grim realities become present and very overtly stated and I feel like the book kind of reflects Ella's transformation. In the beginning, Ella's trying to pretend things aren't as bad as they are. She's trying to tell herself stories and, you know, ignore all the terrible things that are happening. But as she spends longer and longer in the prison camp, her imagination just can't take it and she has to be faced with the stark reality. And as it all hits her, it starts hitting the reader. And I feel like overall, Lucy did a very good job of slowly stripping back the imagination to show the stark reality. And I think it actually worked for this story. However, the ending ruined it. I thought the ending was very, very unrealistic and was just a bit 
too rushed and let's make it all neatly tied up in such a way because this is a young adult book. So the ending didn't work for me. While it could happen, I guess, I felt like it was just dodging away from making a sad or very dark ending and I didn't like that aspect of it. Then to get an E in potions, I read The Clocks by Agatha Christie. Guys, Agatha Christie can do no wrong. In this one, it's a Perot murder mystery where um, the murder happens and all the clocks are set to the same time, which I believe is 4.31. And at the same time, Perot is not present in the area when this murder happens. And actually, Perot embodies the armchair detective trope because he gets challenged to actually sit in an armchair and solve the case while he's not actually on the scene or interviewing people himself. So instead of spending a lot of time with Perot, although you do get to see him, you spend quite a lot of time with the policemen, like Hardcastle, and I just really liked the policemen. Usually I don't really like the policemen in mysteries like this, but in this one, I really liked all of the characters, even the policemen when they made blunders they kind of admitted it they weren't stuck up about it they were like oh i wish i'd seen that or i wish i'd been aware or that's my mistake and i felt like it was a really good mystery and i just i really enjoy agatha christie guys then in herbology to get an a i listened to a study in scarlet by by arthur conan doyle and it was read to me by stephen fry stephen fry read this one really really well However, studying Scarlet, I am torn. The first 50% where we're with Holmes, where we're with Watson, where they're meeting each other for the first time and solving the mystery, that was all interesting. That was all written really well and was actually so enjoyable. FYI, I haven't enjoyed that much Sherlock Holmes in the past. However, the second 50% where they tried to show the backstory was entirely unnecessary. Did I really care about that backstory? Absolutely not. Although it adds some depth to the reasons why the person did what they did, it was a bit racist. The descriptions in that were a bit racist and then it was just a bit boring because I didn't care. It was a jarring transition from part one to part two. So overall, mm, mixed feelings. Another disappointment. For an E in um, Herbology, I read The Affairs of the Mysterious Letter by Alexis Hall. So if you didn't know, Alexis Hall is my favourite new adult author, but wait, this is not new adult, this is young adult fantasy. And I was very intrigued to see him write a young adult novel. It's a fantasy retelling of Sherlock Holmes actually, where Sherlock is Shahazarat or something like that. She Sherlock is a she basically, and Sherlock is definitely LGBT plus. She loves women. And I think she also loves men. I think she's bisexual. And then we've got Watson, who's actually a captain in this one, and he is also LGBT plus. And this just, this book was a mess. So I'm going to say some good things first. First of all, I thought it was really great that we had such a cast of LGBT plus characters. In this one, the mystery they're trying to solve is about this woman who wants to get married to her wife. But before she can get married, she's being sent blackmail letters saying that she shouldn't do it. And if she does, secrets are going to be exposed. So the female Sherlock Holmes has been set on the case. And I really liked how characters were just casually LGBT+. They didn't really have to define their identity or whatever. It was just accepted that everybody was kind of... Everybody loved everybody in this world and that was great. That's the only good thing I can really say. So writing for this book was entirely stiff and sounded like I was reading a textbook. The mystery was ridiculous. Like the outcome of the mystery, I was rolling my eyes. That was not a satisfying outcome. And as well as that, what can I say about the characters? The characters felt very 2D. They didn't feel 3D or realistic at all. And as well as that, the author just kept throwing out phases that didn't mean anything to us because nothing was explained. The female Sherlock Holmes might trap a billion ghosts into her heart and then explode them outwards, but we don't know how hard it is to do if the method is not described, which means we cannot see if the stakes are high or not. You can say they casually went to wherever, but if we don't know what wherever is, it has no effect on us. So with nothing explained, the fantasy world was flimsy, and because of the flimsy world building, the whole story just didn't make any sense. It was a total drag. Okay guys, I messed up my newts, like explaining what newts matched with which newts somewhere. So we're just gonna talk about the books and don't care what newts I got. Just know I'm an alchemist and be happy. Uh, then I read In the Middle of Somewhere by Rowan Parrish and this one follows these two characters. It's new adult by the way and it follows these two characters who kind of have this chance meeting and 
one of them lives in this small town he's very introverted and he's kind of like this huge buff guy with this really soft personality and the other guy is really sharp edges he is a professor and he is um, in a dire financial situation so he comes to this small town to get a job but it's kind of just one step on a journey to somewhere bigger and when they fall in love inevitably because it's a new adult romance guys these two guys have this big problem where they're trying to learn how a relationship works they're trying to learn how to be honest with each other about each other's past and what it means to be like in a relationship and as well as that this small town guy has deep roots in this city in this small town he doesn't want to leave however the other guy is just using this job as a step to the next thing and is eventually planning on moving and leaving. So where does that leave their relationship? So I want to say that In the Middle of Somewhere is a huge contemporary kind of romance. Not much happens. It's just about these two guys trying to figure out their relationship. In the beginning, I didn't really like it. I felt like it was very juvenile. The writing style is very juvenile. The characters were very 2D and the romance was a bit ridiculous. Their meet cute was the most ridiculous meet cute I've ever met. Nobody meets that way. Nobody does what they do when they meet strangers like that for the first time. I just found that completely unrealistic. However, the more I read, the more the characters became three dimensional and had emotions and past, and the more I cared about their relationship, started shipping them, started loving them and wanting them to be safe and happy. So the more I went on, the more these two men stole my heart. And by the end of it, I was just really happy with what ha went down. And it did deal with homophobia, intense homophobia, so trigger warning for that, and also trigger warning for suicide attempt. But it wasn't that bad in the end, it wasn't that bad. So the next book I read, we're kind of in the new adult section of this wrap up, I read Glitterland by Alexis Hall. It was amazing. Other than the colour purple, this was my other five star read of this month. So Glitterland is about these two guys, one of them is from Essex, He's kind of the stereotypical Essex guy, if you know what that means in British English. And he's just a bit like, don't want to be offensive here, he's a bit floofy, he's really into fashion. And the author writes in his accent, so he's always like, all right, babes, let's just go down to the chippy. And just the way that he talks is just, it's such an Essex thing. And as well as that, he falls in love with this upper class, author who's very posh, who's very smart, who's had like this um, higher education. So basically from two different sides of the like social, I don't know, social groups, they're from two very different social classes and they kind of have to make it work for each other because you know one of them's got like the fake tan, the fashion life, the other's all about higher education and is kind of like doesn't want to be seen dating him. So they've got to make that work for each other. It's really cute, it's really adorable, and as I have said in previous videos, I keep bringing this up, but I've recently moved to Australia, so when I was reading this book set in England with such British vibes to it, I mean, you can't get more British than that Essex feel and that, you know, you know, stuck up upper class English vibe. Having that just felt like I was just feeling home. In the end, this book turned up to be the opposite of insta love and the opposite of the mental health is fixed by love. And I want to say that especially because it really delved into these topics deeply. Um, even though he's upper class and all stiff and high education, he does have, by, he is bipolar, he has anxiety and depression, I believe, and he really struggles with that in these books. And the way people treat him, depending on whether they know about his mental illnesses or not, is very apparent. And at the end of the book, they talk about romance and dealing with these mental illnesses. And oh yeah, it was the opposite of Insta Love. I'm not spoiling anything by saying that at the end of this book, the characters haven't even said I love you, which is quite rare for a romance book. But I feel like when they talk about why or when they have this big talk at the end of the book, it makes sense why they haven't said I love you yet. I thought it was really good. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Loved it. I have to talk about Rays by Rowan Parrish. This was one of my most anticipated new adult MM releases of this year. It's the third book in the Riven series, which is Rockstar Romance. And this one follows Felix and Huey. Huey is someone who wasn't alcoholic but has recovered. Now he mentors other alcoholics through their problems and their tough situations. And then we've got Felix who doesn't know what he wants to do with his life. He helps his sister get his, her big break 
when it comes to rock star music but that means he's kind of left thinking now what do i do with myself felix and huey start to have feelings for each other and then again it's just very contemporary romance where they're both trying to deal with their emotions and their futures that are coming up Huey was a bit scary to read about because Huey relates to me a lot. I feel like Huey has a lot of my personality traits, but then to the extreme. And just seeing them just makes you rethink your whole life and everything like that. So reading this book was really impactful for me and a bit emotional for me. I feel like it did a very good job of discussing the fact that you can be fully recovered from an addiction, but that does not mean it stopped impacting your life or that you cannot regress at some points but you can still regress and be recovered at the same time it's hard for me to explain this but i feel like this book talks about that a lot and i just feel like it does those themes pretty well it also really talks about miscommunication and communication felix and huey really have to learn to communicate with each other and they learn how communication is different for each and every relationship as well as that you get some lovely cameos from characters from previous books so i enjoyed seeing those characters come up again a lot <sighs> three more books guys i'm going to try and do this quickly oh my gosh oh my gosh okay so then we've got distortion by victor dixon this one is the second book in the ascension series and it's a translated novel from French. It follows these children who have been sent up into space to go on a speed dating reality TV show that's set in space. They're supposed to colonize Mars when they get there in these couples that are formed on the journey on the way. However, in the first book, we learn that there's a lot more sinister things going on behind the scenes of this TV show than expected. This one just continues on from there and I was a bit disappointed. I enjoyed it a lot less more than the first one. That's because suddenly I could see how juvenile the writing style was. There's quite a lot of exclamation marks, too many of them. And there are just some really cringe lines, especially when it comes to the romance. I feel like the romance storylines of this one are so juvenile. I've also realised how 2D the characters are. They, they have these traits like this Asian kid is really smart and this child has a disability. And they're kind of limited to those things formatting their whole personality rather than them being 3D characters. While the concept is still so interesting in the plot and what's happening and the political game schemes and the way everybody's playing and manipulating each other, so, so, so interesting and makes me want to keep reading and makes me quite addicted to reading. The characters need a lot of work, the writing style needs a lot of work and the plot needs a tiny bit more tightening up. So while this one is good, I feel like it could just be better if it was edited more. The next book I read is Between Us and the Moon. Oh my gosh, I can't remember the name of the author, but it's going to be on the cover. I believe it's Rebecca Maziel. I could be entirely wrong. So Between Us and the Moon is about this girl who goes to holiday with her family and she tells a lie before getting into a relationship with someone. And she's trying to pretend to be more like her older sister because her older sister is more mature and more popular and gets more guys than her, etc, etc. The lie she tells is about her age. She's actually underage for the guy that she ends up dating. So this is one that I talked about with some people on Bookstagram. So if you follow me and you look at my stories, you could have seen me talk about this book a bit because I was talking about how we should read books about tropes and things that we dislike and disagree with. I completely disagreed with her decision to lie about her age and I spent the majority of this book very, very frustrated with the fact that she was lying about her age, what she did while she lied about her age and the fact that she never considered what an impact this could have on the guy that she was lying to if it got out that he was with an underage girl. But while she ignores all of that, she kind of does a lot of growing in this book too. She learns a lot about life and the way it works. She learns a lot about relationships. She learns about the struggles and the disappointments that come with lying. And she kind of learns about what this lie really means by the end of the book. It was really frustrating. I was grinding my teeth, especially as Andrew, who is the male love character, is such a lovely guy. I understand why she lied, don't approve of it, but I really appreciate the message that the author got across at the end and I feel like it came off more as a cautionary tale for why you should not lie about your age when you meet people or when you might end up dating someone or even when it comes to having friends and assuming things about other people. I feel like those two messages were brought to the forefront really 
well. So while I didn't enjoy reading this book, I feel like it has a very important message that maybe some teenagers need to read about, learn and hear before they do something that could be dangerous to themselves and to other people as well. Definitely mixed feelings about my experience, but overall I feel like it was an important story. Last but not least, we have the book that wasn't on my TBR, but I just needed to substitute so I could get to being an alchemist and that is this one. It has no cover but it is called Those Who Ride the Night Winds by Nikki Giovanni and this is a poetry collection. Nikki Giovanni's poems in this one really focus on being black and the black struggle basically. A lot of it is about the black struggle, a lot of it is about being the black struggle and being a poet or being a female black person and writing as well and then the last one seemed to be quite romancy which felt a bit random, but her writing is amazing. She has this really interesting format that has to deal with ellipses and pauses. And I'm going to listen to a recording of her reading these ones out loud because I feel like it could be very interesting to see how she reads it, seeing as how it's written on the page. I felt like a lot of these lines just like hit home, were very emotional, and it was a really good poetry collection. I really enjoyed it. And this was actually another five star read for me this month. Three five stars. Guys, this video was so long, so I'm going to end it here. Sorry for the wrap up being huge, but 17 books, there's no way you can talk about that quickly. Thank you so much for watching. Please let me know in the comment section down below what you read in the month of August. What was your favourite read? What was your worst one? Have you read any of the books that I talked about? Please give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Hit that subscribe button if you want to see more. And don't you forget to hit that notification bell to be updated every time I have a new video. And I will see you in the next one. Goodbye.